Good morning again. All right, this morning we are going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus are recorded for us in all four of the Gospels, and we're reading each one. No, we're not going to read each one today, (laughs) although that would be awesome to do. Uh, But we're going to read portions from the Gospel of Luke, and so you can head that direction if you like, Um, Luke chapter 20. But we're going to begin with a a verse a little bit earlier in the account of Luke's Gospel. I want to read to you a few words of Jesus, words that he spoke just days before he would be crucified. Jesus, at this time, was riding a donkey into Jerusalem. Today we call this event Palm Sunday. It's the day that all the pilgrim crowds who had come into Jerusalem for Passover, they hailed Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, the long-expected King who would deliver the nation of Israel. And they believed that he would save them from their Roman occupation. But on his approach to the city of Jerusalem that day, Jesus paused. And in Luke 19, 41, it tells us what happened. It says that as he drew near, that is, as he drew near the city, he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So this is amazing. While the crowds celebrated Jesus, He had a moment of heartache and a moment of sorrow. They were excited, but he was saddened. Because for all the joy of that moment, Jesus knew that ultimately his own nation would reject him. And the consequence of that rejection would be very difficult. In 70 AD, just 30 years or so after this event, we know that Jerusalem would be destroyed. The Roman general Titus would come in and he would level it and fulfill the exact words that Jesus prophesied, taking every brick off of every brick. But Jesus, that's not what he wanted for his people. That's not what he wanted for the nation of Israel. He wanted to bring them peace. But he says they did not recognize the things that make for peace. They missed it. And because they did not recognize those things and embrace them, peace never came. You know, Jerusalem's still waiting for peace. Still, peace will come. Peace will come when he returns. But in this day, Jesus expressed his sorrow that they didn't recognize the moment. Listen, we have a lot to celebrate in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And there's plenty of emotion, and rightfully so, in a day like today. But we should also be careful not to fall into the same trap as the people of Jerusalem in that first Easter week. You know, we get dressed up and we sing songs and we have big meals and those, all of those things are wonderful. But we don't want to miss the things that make for peace. And listen, not just personal peace. We need personal peace. We, all of us, we need peace of mind. We need peace of heart. We certainly need peace in our communities. We certainly need peace in our nation. We certainly need peace in the world. But all those expressions of peace are not even the most important expressions of peace or the most important peace. 
the most important peace that we can have and that we must have, the peace that comes first is we must have peace with God. You see, when Jerusalem was destroyed, that destruction was allowed by God as an act of judgment against that nation. And judgment came because they didn't recognize the things that make for peace. So this morning, we're going to look at the things that make for peace. The things that Jesus left for us between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, Jesus left two things that make for our peace. And that is really good news. That is really the good news that we celebrate. But listen, before we can get to the good news, we must face up to the bad news. People ask you that, do you want the good news or the bad news first? My advice is always take the bad news first. Listen, we have to understand the bad news. The gospel is called the good news. That's what the word gospel means. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus. But it's good news because we first face bad news. And here's the reality. And this gets lost. And the reason that we want to talk about this today is because I believe it gets lost in our culture. It gets lost even in the the modern church. The reason we love Easter and the reason we celebrate, and listen, there are a lot of things I love about Easter. I do like chocolate, and that comes out on Easter. I do love the coming to life of, of, of nature in the springtime environment. I love the goodwill in the community. I love having fun with my kids and with my family. All of those things are wonderful. But those aren't really the things that we celebrate in Easter. What we celebrate is the resurrection of Jesus. And the reason we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus is because we recognize its significance. See, his resurrection is the solution. It is the answer to the bad news. And the bad news is that we all face judgment. Just like the people of Israel did in Jesus' day. We face judgment. And listen, I have no doubt our nation faces judgment. I have no doubt every nation on the earth faces judgment. But God's judgment is just not on a national level. It's on a personal level. Each individual faces the judgment of God. In the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 tells us, It is appointed for men to die once. It is, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. We face a judgment, even a judgment after death. Death is about separation. Death is about the separation of our spirit. We are made in the image of God. That's what separates men and women from the animal kingdom. We share a lot of the same basic physical and physiological structures and systems, but we are separate because God has made man in his image, which means he's given him a spirit, the ability to know God, who is also spirit. But that image of God has been, has been tainted. It has been marred in sin. And because of that, we face judgment. Listen to how Paul describes the return of Christ in his second coming. This is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He talks about the day of the Lord's return, and he says, The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. You see, there's going to be, judgment is about, it's going to be a separation. That's what death is. Physical death is separation of the spirit from the body, but, but spiritual death is to be separated from the, from the life-giving force of God. To be separated from him. That's why he says... 
Those who don't know him or don't obey the gospel, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's the punishment, to be separated from him. And here's the thing, on that day, when we stand before the Lord, each individual will, it is appointed for each to die, and then the judgment, we will need a defense. My daughter is in the eighth grade, and uh, just Friday, her class participated in a school project, a mock trial, and they had to, they were given a case, a a, a fictional case, and they had to be the attorneys for the prosecution and the defense. They had to uh, learn the facts of the case and, and play the roles of witnesses. And we had a bailiff, and we went before a real judge in a real courtroom, and they got to try this case. And uh, they did a great job. It was, it was fascinating. But you know, it's a little unnerving to be in a courtroom, even for a mock trial. But listen, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're all going to need a defense. We're all going to need an advocate, an attorney, to stand with us and to plead our case. Now, as we talk about this, as we talk about the reality of of standing before our Creator, of giving an account to Him of our lives, it is easy for us to make our own defenses. And we can make the defense, hey, I I do look, man, I, I believe in God, But listen, the the God that I believe in is loving, and he would never judge like you're talking about. Many people have that perspective. So I would just grace, uh, as gracefully as I can, just challenge that idea and say, what is it based on? Where does the notion come from that, that God is love, and because God is love, he won't judge? Well, the notion that God is love comes from the Bible. It comes from God's word. 1 John tells us plainly, God is love. But that's important. God is love, not love is God. Not our idea of love is what God is. Who God is is the definition of love. God is love. His actions, his his work, his perspective, his truth. These things are what define love. And so God's word also says, though, that he judges those who do evil. He brings into judgment every work, every act, every thought, every word. You cannot separate love from justice. If God was unjust, he couldn't also be loving. God is both. And we are foolish if we want to accept the testimony of Scripture that God is love, but we want to reject the testimony of Scripture that God judges. We need to accept all of it. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12. Jesus himself says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Those are the words of Jesus. That we should have reverence toward God because of the judgment that we will face. And what is that judgment? Well, we talked about it is separation from Him, and that's really what death is. Romans 6.23 says it so plainly, for the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. Another objection that we might offer in our own defense is, Okay, look, I understand there's a judgment. And I understand that God is is a just God and he's going to set things straight. But look, I've lived a good life, at least better than most other people. And I believe God knows my heart and he knows my intention. Well, here's the thing. If we're going to talk about the truth of Scripture, the thing is we're not judged against each other. It's not how good we are compared to other people. If we think we're better than some, it really doesn't help us. In fact, the Apostle Paul addresses this very idea in the book of Romans, chapter 2. He says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. That is, judge other people. For in whatever you judge another, at least I'm not like them, right? 
You condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things. It's just part of our human nature. But the bottom line is that your good and my good are just not good enough. The standard is God's good, His holiness, who He is, His perfection. And the idea is, yeah, but God knows that I tried. He knows my heart. Listen, that only condemns us more. Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet says that the heart, the human heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We fool ourselves. We lie to ourselves. We make ourselves feel better. Listen to what Jesus says about the human heart. Matthew 15, 19. He says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Listen, I got kids. We've watched every Disney movie that exists almost. And all the cartoons and all the PBS specials and I can just tell you what the philosophy of the world is. The philosophy of the world is that you should follow your heart. The philosophy of the world is, hey, everybody is basically good. And if we could just eliminate the circumstances that, that encourage or force people to be bad, then they would be good. Listen, we can have perfect circumstances. Adam and Eve had perfect circumstances. We don't sin because we're forced to, because of an outside force. We violate God's command and we do these things because what's inside of us is corrupt. Out of the heart proceed these things, evil thoughts, murders. And listen, if you're familiar with the teachings of Jesus, then you know that he took these commands from the Old Testament you shall not kill, you know, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus took these commands, and in the Sermon on the Mount, he elevated them, and he explained. He said, it's not just the action that's sinful. He said, it's the heart that does the action. When you're angry with your brother, that anger is what leads to murder. Murder is just the outward result, but the real issue is the anger in your heart. And you covet, and you want the things that other people have, and you live your life to get those things. You might not actually steal. You may not break the law in that sense. But your heart lives for that and you worship that above honoring God. Adulteries, lusts, fornications. You may not break your marriage vow or you may not um, commit fornication. But the lust in the heart, the desire to do it, the fantasy to do it, and the desire to live those things out, those are sinful. These are the things Jesus taught about. Listen, these were the real issues that were bringing judgment against the nation of Israel. These are the same issues that we face and the same things that will bring judgment against us. And we like to ease the pain of this reality by thinking in terms of degrees. Well, maybe I slipped a little, but I didn't slip too much. But listen, our evil actions, our evil words, our evil thoughts, they are all evidence of evil hearts. Hearts that are corrupt. It really means to be twisted, to be marred away from God's original design. I hesitated to use the illustration I'm about to give because nobody uses phone books anymore. But About a century ago, there was a professional baseball player turned evangelist. His name was Billy Sunday. What a great name for an evangelist. That kid was born to be an evangelist. He just didn't know it until later in life. But, um, you know, long before the internet or Google or email or any of those things, he would write ahead to the mayor of whatever city he was going to be visiting. And he would ask the mayor, can you send me the names of any people who might need a prayer, special prayer, that I can pray for them before I even come? And so he wrote to the mayor of Columbus, Ohio. 
And the, the mayor of Columbus, Ohio did not send him a list of names. He sent him the phone book. <laughs> Everyone is in need. And nobody's unlisted, by the way. All right? Revelation talks about books being opened at the judgment. Each person being judged according to their works. You will one day stand before God, your creator, and you will give an account for your life. Now, it's clear from the teachings of Jesus and really from all of Scripture that we do indeed face God's judgment. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, The wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness, that's sin. That's doing things contrary to God's character and his word and his truth. And we are all sinners The wrath of God. Do you know that's why we need Jesus? Because we face the wrath of God. We face an eternal separation, damnation from him in a place Jesus called hell and described as eternal suffering. That's not something we hear enough of today. We hear, and rightfully so, that we need Jesus because we have problems in our lives. And and if we come to Jesus, we will find solutions for those problems. And that is true. But the first reason we need Jesus is because we face not problems with people and problems in our marriage and problems with our kids and problems with the neighbors and problems in our nation. The first reason we need him is because we face the wrath of God against sin. There's no news worse than that. That's the bad news. But Jesus, he left us the things that are necessary for peace. Peace with God. So let's look at those this morning. Luke chapter 23. I'm going to begin reading. And I'm just going to read this account. I think it's so good for us just to hear what the Bible has to say and for the preacher to shut up once in a while and that I don't get in the way of God's word. So Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 26 and we're going to read um, almost to the end of the chapter. This is speaking of Jesus and his journey to the cross and his crucifixion. It says, Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus was so weakened from the scourging and the beating at his trial, he could not carry his cross all the way to the distance of the execution site. And so they made this man, Simon, carry the cross. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also there two brothers, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, And saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, 
saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. In the day that men stand before God in judgment, none will be able to offer a reason, an objection for the justice of God. For we have earned, we have earned it. But he says, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. We'll pause there. Here's what we need to know about Jesus' death on the cross. It was a sacrifice. We've already read and established the cost of sin is death. Romans, the wage of sin is death. Jesus told, or excuse me, in the Garden of Eden, The instruction from God was, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. That separation from God would begin. Physical death and then ultimately spiritual death. So the cost of sin is death. Jesus' death, it was a payment for our sin. It was a sacrifice. God had already painted this picture for his followers, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Actually, going all the way back to the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, we know they tried to cover themselves physically. They felt shame from their sin, and they tried to hide that shame. Plenty of us today are working hard to hide our shame. And we are very ineffective at it, just as Adam and Eve were. They, they got fig leaves. And they tried to sew some clothes. Had to be horribly uncomfortable. But God, this God came in and he showed them mercy. He gave them a temporary reprieve. He clothed them. And what did he clothe them with? The skins of an animal, Genesis tells us. Do you understand that that means that an animal had to die? God's perfect creation was marred. The first physical death happened as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, but it was a death that would cover their shame. It was a temporary covering, but God provided clothes for them. Later, when God called a man named Abraham and promised to make a nation of him and his descendants, God eventually instituted a whole system of worship in the nation of Israel. And it was, there was a law that you're supposed to keep and things you were to wear and things you could eat and things you couldn't eat. And it was a way for God to train them to think about what it meant to be holy or unholy. But he also provided sacrifices, animal sacrifices. And there were certain sacrifices for certain things. But the idea was always the same, all the way back to the garden. It was sin has happened. A payment must be made. A life must be given. Death is the cost of sin. And so the Israeli, the, 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 the Jewish people, that, that nation, they understood sin brings death because they were always constantly having to sacrifice to cover their sin. Jesus, his death was the ultimate sacrifice. All those earlier animal sacrifices, they were pointing, they were waiting 
They were directing people's eyes and minds and hearts forward to the Messiah who would give his life as the ultimate payment for sin. Listen to what Jesus says. Mark chapter 10, 45, he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and, how did he serve? To give his life a ransom, a payment for many. We already read Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. Thankfully, that verse doesn't end there. The rest of the verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. <coughs> Can I get a bottle of water? Thank you. <coughs> so Jesus' death was a sacrifice. And before we move on, I want to look at one thing. Appreciate it. The place of Jesus' death is very significant. We, we have crosses everywhere. There's a cross right on the wall, right? People wear crosses on their necks. We wear these crosses to remind us of Jesus. But, but I don't know that we often think of the cross as a place of sacrifice, as an, as an altar. You know, in the Old Testament, when God told his people that they were to make these sacrifices to cover sin... He was very specific about the type of altars they could build. You know, he didn't want fancy altars. It says in Exodus chapter 20, it says, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep offerings, your oxen. He says, if you make an altar of stone, if you use stones to build the altar, he said, you should not build it out of hewn stones. In other words, stones that you've, you've shaped. He says, if you use your tools on it, you've profaned it. In other words, God is telling his people, the altar you make, it can't be anything of your design, of your artistic ability. It's just got to be plain dirt, plain rock. I'm not interested in your fancy efforts of appeasement. How often would we try to build something fancy to present to God? Look what I gave, look what I did, look how nice I've been. You know I've put up with my in-laws so well, Lord, for low these many years. None of that has any bearing. None of that affects our standing before God. We have to come with the sacrifice and, and, and in the manner in which he prescribes. And he's not interested in any of our efforts or our abilities or our creativity as payment for sin. Jesus was crucified on a place called Calvary. It's in verse 33. We, we, we read it already. You know, Calvary was just a big hunk of rock in the dirt. And then they stuck a cross on it. The Romans put a cross what scripture refers to as a tree. That was the altar. You know what altar means in Hebrew? We think of altar as like this elevated place where the table or, a, or a, um, a furnace or something. Altar in Hebrew literally means the killing place. Calvary was the killing place. And it's where God allowed his son to offer himself on our behalf. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ has redeemed us. He made the payment for us. And then it quotes from the Old Testament, which says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that day, if you killed your enemy and you hung him on a tree as a sign to, the, to, the, um, to others, then, then Scripture says that, that that person is under judgment. It's a demonstration of their judgment, that they're hung on a tree. Cursed are they. But that wasn't just a rule or a regulation in the Old Testament. It was a prophetic thing that talks to us about what Jesus would do because he hung on the tree. That's what Paul talks about. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ has redeemed us. 
He's the one that took judgment for us. He received the punishment on our behalf. And you know that, that Jesus, in receiving our punishment, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was recognized to be the sacrifice. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John made that connection for people, that Jesus was a fulfillment of those Old Testament sacrifices. He was also innocent. First Peter, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. He was just. He was sinless. He suffered for us. Jesus was an innocent sacrifice. He was a qualified sacrifice. He was even a willing sacrifice. We read that, or we saw that in verse 34 of the text. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was there because he was being obedient to his Father. He chose to go to the cross. He wasn't angry against those who crucified him. He was giving the gift of his life. And Jesus was confident that his sacrifice would be accepted by his heavenly Father. He confidently told the criminal next to him, who said, Lord, remember me. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. He knew that his work would be accepted. Listen to what it's, how it's described in John 19.30. In the Gospel of John, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, finally, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He willingly laid down his life. Hebrews 10.12 said that Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The one sacrifice, complete, perfect, accepted by God. You and I cannot build an altar fancy enough to appease God, but what does satisfy his wrath and his judgment is the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. That's why Jesus left us an empty cross, so that payment could be made. That's the first thing that he left, that we would know peace. The second thing he left, praise God, he left an empty tomb. So let's go read of that. We're going to pick up in verse 50 where we left off, and we're going to go a little bit into chapter 24. It says, Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Don't you love that? They loved Jesus so much, they watched Joseph prepare his body and put it in a tomb, and they said, that's not good enough for our Lord. And so they went home as good Jews to wait out the Sabbath, but they prepared so that they could come back and that they could properly wrap his body. Now, chapter 24. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. 
And they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven, that would be to the disciples, and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Listen, Jesus left us an empty tomb. The women came and found an empty tomb. Peter came and found an empty tomb. Later, we know from the, from the gospel accounts, John came and found an empty tomb. Many others followed. Listen, the witnesses of all the gospels, or the witnesses recorded in all the gospels, they all have the mark of historical accuracy. No one, no one, who takes an honest view of history and historical record, no one, even atheists, they don't dispute that the person Jesus of Nazareth was a real person and that he lived and walked on the earth. But almost equally, no person who honestly looks at the historical record can say that there was a body in the tomb on that day. An empty tomb is an historical record. We have the eyewitness accounts. We also have the evidence that is given to us that in the weeks to come, as the disciples become apostles, begin to preach Jesus and talk about his resurrection, they were never silenced by the Jewish authorities by the production of a body or the Roman authorities by the production of a body. The tomb was empty. The question is, why was the tomb empty? How did it become empty? We have the eyewitness accounts of the body going in. And we have the eyewitness accounts of nothing being found on that day. And then we have the word of the angels. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. There were witnesses of an empty tomb. We also read in our text that Jesus predicted his own resurrection. The resurrection was not a happy accident. It was not a wonderful thing God chose to do in the last moment. It was planned from the beginning, and Jesus predicted his own resurrection. The, the angels even used Jesus' words. It says, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. You know, Jesus not only predicted the resurrection, but he also told us the significance of his resurrection. He did this in the most amazing way, because a couple of months before his own crucifixion and death, we know that he raised a man named Lazarus from the dead. And if you're not familiar with that story, you should go read it today, John chapter 11. My favorite part of that story is we know that Lazarus had been dead for a number of days. And when Jesus goes to raise him from the dead, Lazarus already being in a tomb, he says, roll the stone away. And Lazarus' sister says, Lord, it's been four days. He stinks by now. I mean, it's, it's a practical concern, right? But Jesus had conversations with Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And what did Jesus say? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Some, maybe some of you might be around when Jesus comes back. The world sure seems ready for it. You may never die if you know Jesus. You may just be resurrected from your present state into the new body. Can't wait to get hair back. It's starting to thin back there. Listen, Jesus says, Though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says this, Do you believe this? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Mary? 
Jesus promised resurrection and eternal life to those who believe in him. I think the coolest thing about the resurrection of Lazarus is when Jesus stood out there in the graveyard, he told him to move the stone, and then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And I didn't make this observation, but somebody once said that Jesus had to use Lazarus' name because if he would have just said, come forth, it would have been chaos. On the day that Jesus comes for his people, when he returns, when the trumpet sounds in the air, it's going to be the most glorious, organized chaos as the body of Christ is caught up to be with him forever. He who believes in me will have eternal life. Listen. This resurrection day, have you laid hold of the things that make for peace? Because in an empty cross, we know we see, we recognize the payment for sin has been made. The wrath of God can only be appeased by a full and perfect payment for our sin. But we have an empty cross where the perfect payment, the full payment was made in the sinless sacrifice of Jesus. Is that real for you? Is the empty cross more than just a symbol on a wall or a piece of jewelry around your neck? Have you laid hold of the things that make for peace? The empty tomb. It is the evidence, the demonstration of the resurrection of Jesus. It is the confirmation that the payment for sin was made in full. As Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, it's our victory over death. Death no longer has power over those who have laid hold of Jesus by faith. Jesus says, even if you die, yet you will live. And some of you will never die and only live. Death is defeated. It is possible to have peace with God. And you know, here's the most amazing thing. When we have peace with God, then it's possible for us to also have the peace of God. Please don't get lost in your stress and in your worry and in your anxiety about your marriage and your children and your job and your future and your... Fi don't drown in that in the way that makes you lose sight of the most important thing that we need. We want peace with our circumstances. That's not even important compared to the peace that we must have first, which is peace with God, so that we can escape his judgment against our sin. But that's the glorious hope of Resurrection Sunday. And we have an empty cross and an empty tomb that says that Jesus has made a way for us to escape that wrath. That's good news. That's good news. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing. And I would be remiss in my obligations if I did not give everyone in this room an opportunity to confess faith in Christ. These are not magical words. This is not a mantra. I'm going to give you words to say, but, but they're only a tool to be an expression of your own heart. And I would say don't even repeat after me unless in your heart in faith toward God, in good conscience, you want to lay hold of the empty cross and the empty tomb. Scripture describes eternal life as a gift, and truly it is. We don't earn it, we receive it. 
we receive it by faith, it does require a few things. It requires repentance, confession, that is acknowledging that we are sinners before God and not justifying ourselves, but owning those things before him. It does require repentance, which means turning around, not living our own way anymore, but living his way. And he is there, and he is with us, and he empowers us and makes that possible. It's impossible for us, but it's possible with him. And it's not just an experience to have or a thing to say on a Sunday. When we celebrate Easter, it's, it's a change of your life. That evil heart that we spoke about earlier in the message, it's the transformation of that heart. It's, it's the Lord making that heart clean and whole and alive. We talk about being washed by the blood of Christ. The scriptures say that those who put their faith in him are a new creation, a new creation. So if you want to confess Christ today and lay hold of the things that make for peace, I would just ask you to pray with me, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. And I have no justification for my sin. But Lord, I confess that I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe it was in payment for my sin. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. and that you did it to give eternal life. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. Lord, I ask that you would put a new heart inside of me. And Lord, I surrender my life to you. You are king. Lord, I ask for grace to follow you every day. Thank you for the things that make for peace. Amen. I'm going to leave you with one verse, and then we're going to sing. That verse is Romans 5, 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, made right by faith, it says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.